by any member of the committee concerning the amendment. Seeing not all in favor of the amendment, please say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. No. The those have it, therefore the amendment fails. We're back on the bill. Are there any other questions or comments by the committee concerning the bill? Representative Faircloth, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would just like to inquire both for this uh, bill, and, or the PCS, and also for the Farm <coughs> Act, uh, uh, whether or not there has been a study of the impact on the need for enforcement personnel. Uh, if that's been addressed, I'd like to know that. If And the findings, if it has not, I'd like to know that. Representative Dixon? Uh, there has not. There's If if the uh, if this bill passes without the ban, there will be a drastic increase in need for personnel. Uh, if this bill passes without the ban, we will put 800 of our law enforcement dogs and their handlers out of business. You have a follow-up, Representative Fairclough? That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments by any member of the committee on the bill? Representative Reese, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could I get a little more explanation on that statement that we put 800 officers out of business and dogs? Representative Dixon? I will, I will try to do that as briefly as I can, uh, Representative Reese. The reason, the, the, the overall reason or the base reason for suggesting a ban on smokable is because our law enforcement cannot tell the difference between <coughs> marijuana and smokable hemp. And I'll give one example. An officer sees uh, someone violating one of the traffic laws. Say they run a stoplight, or let's say they're speeding 75 miles an hour. And the law officer uh, pulls them over, the windows roll down, the officer smells marijuana. The operator of the vehicle says, I'm smoking hemp. There's no field test, and so even if the law officer saw something, packages that looked suspicious on the back seat or something like that, the law officer would say, have to slow down, give you a ticket for red light or whatever, and, no go, and, and go no further. On the other issue of the canine, uh, I have a picture which I'll show you, uh, or any of the members, that there was a recent FedEx uh, situation that had uh, CBD flour on five gallon buckets that was actually marijuana. These, these dogs will alert too. And it effectively, with the excuse of it being hemp, it effectively makes null and void whatever those canines would, uh, would alert to. And Mr. Chairman, there might be uh, somebody in the audience that could address this uh, situation relative to the canines more articulately than I have. I'll ask, is there anyone in the audience that can shed any light on the topic we're talking about, the canines? Would you please state your name, who you yes. represent, and we'd be glad to hear from you as briefly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Rianne Norwald. I'm the Legislative Director for the SBI. Um, I'm going to clarify, sorry, Representative Dixon. It wouldn't put the handlers out of business but it would put potentially 800 dogs in our state out of business, and that's roughly $10,000 to $15,000 a dog um, just to purchase them. That's not the training that's included. And that's because we train them to smell for multiple um, it, like substances at a time. And a lot of dogs at local um, level, they train for a lot of different things. So they could be a cadaver dog on top of a marijuana and cocaine dog. So. You can teach them, you can't unteach them. So any dog that smells for marijuana at this time would have to be retired, and we would have to purchase brand new dogs and retrain them. So Does that answer your question, Representative Reeves? Or do you have a follow-up? I understand what she's saying. I would probably be better served with a comment at this point. Yes, sir. You recognize for a comment? And, and I guess where I'm getting confused, and if I'm wrong, I'd be happy for um, the lady just spoke to explain it, or staff. I mean, what we're talking about right now is just one of the things that 
officers use to determine whether or not they're going to search. So for instance, if an officer is in a situation where they've gotten an informant that said, hey, this person is going to be driving here in a red Toyota with a blue suit on and is going to have 20 pounds of marijuana, you can still go search for the marijuana. I mean, it's, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that what's going to happen, what would happen if we didn't have the ban, is that there would be a defense that the person could put up and say, hey, what I had was hemp and not marijuana, but I'd be pretty shocked if that officer wouldn't still arrest that person, in my experience. I hadn't seen officers say, you know what, there's a chance I could be wrong, so I'm not gonna arrest you. So I, I, would, just, I would just respectfully disagree on that point. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Representative McNeil, you're recognized. Well, I, I just want to comment on Representative Debrief's statement. I think the I think where an officer stops a, a, a car because a reliable informant has has told the officer that he'd be driving in this car and he had marijuana might happen one percent of the time. Very 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 small amount of the time is an officer going to stop because somebody says uh, a reliable informant gives them information. Uh, by far the preponderance of the time that an officer is going to encounter this on the street is through a traffic stop for, for some motor vehicle violation. So I think what he's talking about is a very rare, rare circumstance. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Melville, you're recognized to answer Representative Blackwell's question. Representative Blackwell, uh, based on my research, a positional isomer relates to the position of the isomer within the molecular structure of uh, whatever chemical is being referenced to. So for example, if you were to take something like butane or isobutane, uh, they would have the same molecular structure, but they would have a different positional structure with respect to those isomers. Follow up. Yes, sir. I wasn't really so much interested in the specific definition as trying to understand that the PCS doesn't refer to positional uh, as one of the types of ice. It says Isomer, isomer is defined under control substances to mean structural, geometric, optical, and stereo isomers. The legislation uses the term positional, and so what I'm trying to understand is that it, it, there may be a distinction between positional and these other four that are named, but I thought it odd that the PCS doesn't refer to positional, which is the word used in the actual bill. And so, I, I'm wondering why. So Representative Blackwell, if you, if you look at the bill, we're striking uh, on page one lines 14 through 17, we're, we're sort of amending the definition of isomer and we're actually striking any reference to structural geometric uh, optical isomer um, and we're restating it and unless it's otherwise used so where positional isomer uh, is used within some other definition within the bill then it's going to include that isomer as opposed to if we're looking at sort of the general definition um, on page one lines 14 sorry lines 26 because like representative Dixon would you like to uh, comment on that representative Blackwell this, this language came from the uh, Attorney General's office. Uh, this is an agency bill, and this language that is recommended here comes directly from the Attorney General's office. And they found uh, whatever you're just talking about, they talked about it too. And some smart people found a way to manipulate a little bit here, a little bit there, and this is to correct that so that they don't lose their prosecution. Representative Torbett, you're recognized. Thank you. My question is for the bill sponsor, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not by, uh, good morning. Uh, not being a, or being a non-lawyer and a non-farmer, can you tell me if this prohibits the growth of hemp in any way by North Carolina farmers for smoke wool or other types? Representative Dixon. This does not, it does not prevent a licensed grower from growing, handling, selling, transporting any product that they can produce. The only thing it does is that it prohibits consumption 
of smokable hemp with the exception of the CBD oil is accepted. Does that answer your question, sir? Well, Representative Reeves, you're recognized a second time. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I understand and, and definitely respect uh, Representative McNeil's experience. And, and I'm not saying that that's going to happen all the time, but I guess I was trying to say in a little more inarticulate way, this isn't really going to stop any officers from stopping anybody on marijuana. If you go through that traffic stop, if I understood, I mean, as much as I'd love for the SBI memo that kind of helped get this going to be the be all end all, my belief is the SBI can't tell a Wake County deputy or a Raleigh City police officer whether or not he can stop somebody, whether or not he can develop re reasonable suspicion that that person is carrying an illegal substance. What the SBI can say is that we don't believe that you can tell the difference in the smell. And really, if you look throughout our case law over the last, I'd say, 10 years, it's really only been over the last four or five years that officers started leaning on the smell of marijuana a little bit more than they used to. You can still get somebody for having an illegal substance. What the smokable hemp did is that it complicated some. Yes, it may have complicated it some. I just wouldn't go as far as to say that this suddenly stops everything. And I would be absolutely, positively shocked that we didn't pass this ban, that officers would stop charging people with having marijuana in their possession after a traffic stop. I would be absolutely, positively shocked if that was a result. Thanks, sir. Representative Alves, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, with regard to the uh, production of hemp products, the flower of the hemp is going to be a, a byproduct of that activity. I mean, they're going to be uh, smokable hemp or flowers of the hemp product. What's going to be the proper and legal disposition of those products? Representative Dixon? If you know, they could, the farmer can sell them to anybody who is legally licensed to purchase them. Uh, I will make this explanation, Representative Adams, that the, the bud or the flower is where the quality CBD oil comes from. And you can, you can produce that flower uh, and sell it to an individual. The individual can then extract the CBD oil from it or turn it into smokable hemp. You can't do both. You, it's an either or. You either process the, the flour for CBD oil or you process it for smokable. Thank you. Yes, sir. Representative Smith, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Reeves, I, I've got to disagree with you. Um, probable cause to a law enforcement officer means that something is more likely to have occurred than not, that a crime is more likely to occur than not. Currently, an officer on the street can use his experience and training and, and kind of readily understand and, and identify the smell and the sight of what marijuana is. If smokable hemp is legal, then there is no way that same officer is going to be able to distinguish between the hemp and the marijuana. So he cannot say he has at that point probable cause to believe that more likely than not it's marijuana, especially if the guy's telling him, hey, this is him. Could be lying to him. That happens often in law enforcement. So I, I just completely disagree with you. I, and I'm not an alarmist by any means, but this will take, in almost every case, the ability for an officer to develop probable cause uh, and to be able to take any further enforcement action on what could be marijuana in a vehicle or in a house. Um, I just want to make that point. Thank you. Uh, it's quarter till. I'm ready to call the question, but I'll ask for one last time. Is there anyone else on the committee that has any question or comment <coughs> concerning <coughs> the PCA? <laughs> <laughs> Hearing none, I'm sorry to those who signed up to speak, but we do not have time for any public comment. Therefore, I will call the question asked, do I hear a motion for a PCS to Senate Bill 352 receive a favorable report with a serious referral to rules? 
Representative Stevens makes that motion. Do we have any discussion on the motion before we vote? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, say no. No. The ayes have it. We'll receive a favorable report. Thank you. No further business. Come for the committee. We're adjourned. <laughs>